Father, I thank you for this person I'm standing next to. And I thank you, God, that today in this moment they actually sense your favor and your blessing. I pray, God, that today they are encouraged with just something from God's word. And I thank you, Father, for your favor in their life. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can give that person a high five. We all have a here, and we all have a there. And sometimes the time between our here and our there will be really quickly, and then sometimes the time between here and there seems like it takes forever. I mean, you're here might be high school and you're there college. You're here might be singlehood and you're there marriage. You're here might be sickness and you're there health. You're here might be a broken relationship and you're there reconciliation. You're here might be toddlers and you're there might be grown children. You're here might be unemployment and you're there might be a dream job. And what I've learned is that throughout life there will always be a series of Here's and there's. And the thing is, once you get there, it's no longer there, it's actually here, and you're on your way to a new there, which becomes here, and you're on your way to a new there. Are you, are you tracking with me here? <laughs> and we're going to keep going from here to there until we get to heaven, the final there. And I think every trip from here to there on planet Earth is actually preparing us for our final there. A few years ago, Philip and I, moved into a new house, and I realized a few things. I realized, first of all, that I had more stuff than I needed. And not all of it was actually going to my new home, my new there. See, sometimes the stuff that you have here won't actually serve you there. And you might have to learn a few new things along the road. You might have to think bigger thoughts. For us at Oasis, we've had a few different here and there journeys just in our locations. You know, we started in a home Bible study in 1984. Most of you weren't born. Shut up right now. <laughs> and then we moved from that home Bible study to an elementary school because Philip and I thought that was a good idea. Only I, it didn't, we didn't really thrive there. We had to go back to a home. I didn't like that there. And then we went to a community center in Beverly Hills, and then we went we were in a storefront, and then we were in a junior high school auditorium, and then we purchased a theater down on Wilshire Boulevard, and we're there for, you know, 15 years or so, and then we moved into this beautiful cathedral. There were 16 different locations, 16 different here to there journeys. And right now, it's an amazing time in the history of our church. Some of you are perhaps new to Oasis. Well, welcome to the adventure of going from here to there. And it's not an accident, actually, that you're here now, I mean, I, I realize that soon we're going to be adding a campus to Oasis Church. We'll be adding a location in the San Fernando Valley. It's another there, right? And I started to think about all the ways that we need to handle our transitions from here to there. Because between our here, whatever that might be for you, to the there, it can be a little bit messy. And things don't always go how you want them to go. And what I think is that sometimes on our journey from here to there, you know, obstacles come up. So let's say my here is here, but my there is the lobby. And I want to get to the lobby because that would be where I want to go. Now, the easiest would be to go down this path. And so I'm headed down here, but then, you know, Super Dude in his Rams jersey shows up <laughs> to block me from getting, you know, to the there. And I can get so bothered, right? I can just... Now, there's sometimes in the Bible when there is an obstacle that's in front of you, and the Bible tells us to speak to the mountain. And so there are sometimes you speak to the mountain, and you speak to the mountain. Let me just smack you for a second, okay? And you keep speaking to the mountain, and you speak to the mountain, and you speak to the mountain. But in between speaking to the mountain, I'm being developed here. Right? But see, sometimes an obstacle comes up, and it's not, it's not always a bad thing. See, sometimes the obstacle comes up, and it's simply because rather than going this way, I'm here, it's redirecting. It's redirecting here. And so then I go, okay, maybe here is the path. But then I'm, and I'm flowing. I'm going, yeah, I'm on my way to the lobby. But then, 
Another obstacle, thanks for seeing your family around here, you just get pulled into my sermons. That's how we roll. And so another obstacle comes up and I can just get discouraged and go, I'm just going to quit. I'm going to quit. Can I cry on your shoulder right now? I'm just going to quit because I just give up. It's hard. God's mean. But maybe, thank you, maybe it's simply a redirect. And maybe it's because this is actually the path I was always supposed to walk. Maybe this is the path because it's along this path I'm going to meet people that I'm supposed to be praying for or the experiences my life might be able to help someone. But see, I wouldn't even find this path if I wasn't willing to actually consider the obstacles not always as bad things. That sometimes they're simply redirects. And so emotions can get involved when we're on our journey, right from here to there. And there is no such thing as a painless move from here to there. And it doesn't even matter what the journey is, what you're here to there is. What I found is that God is always more concerned working in me I think about Joseph, right? He had this dream to get from here to there. And then he ends up sold into slavery and ends up in prison. That was not what he saw, but God was always concerned with what he was working in Joseph. And so there are different here's and there's, different in different areas of our life, and there will be some challenges. But the thing about God is that he doesn't change. He doesn't change. And sometimes we might mess up this moment called here, because we're not present in this moment. So we have to be careful about falling into the trap of one, one day when, right? One day when I get to my there, one day when I graduate high school, when I get into college, when I get a job, when I get a better job, when I get a wife, when I get a better wife, when I get children, when the children leave, when I retire, right? We keep, as opposed to figuring out what here is about, we keep trying to put it off and look to there. So I've learned that there are a few things we can learn a few things that we're going to need, a few tools, to get us from here to there. You ready? You ready? Okay. So the first tool is actually the Word of God. If we're going to get from here to there, we have to trust that His Word is the guide. It is the lamp to our feet. That's what the Bible says. It's the lamp to our feet, the light to our path. Our feelings aren't the light to our path. Our wants aren't the light to our path. His word is. Hebrews 4, 12. I think they're going to put this up on the screen. Let's actually all read this together. Okay, ready? One, two, three. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The Word of God, the first thing it says, the Word of God is living. This book has the power to change lives. It has the power to pick up addicts out of the gutter. It has the power to turn the timid into courageous. It has the power to restore broken marriages. It has the power to give hope to the lost. It has the power to get your life back on track. It has the power to heal your heart. It has the power to encourage you. It's living. It's living. Isaiah 55, God said this. He says, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The word of God is alive. It will accomplish what God desires. It is active. That word alive literally means at work. The word of God is continually working. It's like a map. See, a map shows you the road you can take to reach your there, right? On our, your life is basically a mission trip. In case anybody ever asks you, have you ever been on a mission trip? You just say, yes, I'm breathing, right? <laughs> your life is a lifelong mission trip. It, your mission trip, the future is unknown, and the Bible is our map. The Bible is filled with stories. It's filled with adventure and poetry. And, and inside the pages are some of the greatest wisdom for all time. And when I read the Bible, I certainly appreciate the stories. But I read it saying, God, show me. Change me. Strengthen me. Energize me. Correct me. Equip me. Because I'm trying to get from here to there. You're on the planet for a reason. 
It's not an accident that you're here now. You have a mission to walk out. And his mission for you, should you choose to accept it, will only be accomplished with his instructions. You know, in that scripture, Hebrews 4, that we just read, it says it's, the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to the dividing of soul and spirit. So you and I, we are a three-part being. We're a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now, your body will always choose what feels good. I need that whole chocolate cake. Right? I need to get angry. Like, whatever feels good, your body always chooses that. Now, your spirit will always choose God's way. Always. If you have surrendered your heart and your life to the God who loves you, and Jesus is your leader, then your spirit will always choose God's way. So your body always chooses what feels good. Your spirit chooses God's way. God's way. Your soul is the swing boat. And it's the word of God that actually guides our soul. See, often our soul can lead us astray because it clamors for attention. And they're constantly at war with each other because the body wants its way and the spirit wants to please God. But it's the word of God that actually directs our soul to line it up with the word of God. So the word of God is alive and active. Second Timothy says this, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now there are, you know, up around Mulholland and in Malibu, some of those roads that are on the mountains in particular and always on the freeways, they, there are guardrails. And you know what? I'm grateful for the guardrails especially if there's a steep drop on the other side. Most of us are not frustrated with the guardrails. We're not thinking, ah, this road is so boring. I just want to go right over that guardrail because that's where life really is. No, we appreciate that the guardrails keep us on the road and make the path clear. Well, in the same way, God's word keeps us on the path. It's like the the word is our guardrail. It keeps us from going where we shouldn't go. So we get to navigate this amazing journey called life. And God has trusted us with this moment. He's trusted us with the mission from getting to here to there and then here to there and then here to there. And he's honored us with free will. God dignified humanity from the beginning with the ability to choose right and wrong, the ability to choose his way or not. He's dignified. We are not puppets. We get to choose. And he's given us the Bible to help us choose wisely so that we can get to our there without being destroyed. In the Old Testament, in the book of 2 Kings, it tells the story of a man named Josiah. Now, Josiah was born into a time in history when the children of Israel, it was just a disastrous time. King Manasseh, who was Josiah's grandfather, had drifted so far from God He led Israel in the worst abomination ever, like demon worship and human sacrifice. These were the people that God had led out of Egypt, and now they were doing all sorts of atrocities. They were so far from God. Well, Josiah becomes king at the age of eight, and 18 years into his reign, as a young 26-year-old, he is concerned about the house of God. He's concerned about the temple. Something in him knows that this isn't right. And so he asks someone to go clean it. He sends someone to clean it. And while they're cleaning it, they find the book. And it's dusty because it hasn't been opened for a very long time. So it's easy to see the reason that the landscape looked as bad as it did with human sacrifice, with all the pain and idol worship, is because God's ways weren't going on. And so Josiah is heartbroken when he realizes how far they had come, how far away from there that they should have been. See, you and I, we find out who we are in the Bible, and if we don't know what his word says, we'll never have a sense of purpose or contentment. But what I found is that in the worst moment of our life, the entrance of his word can change everything. It did for Josiah. 
and it did for the people of Israel. It had been a mess. It was horrible. But once he read the word of God, he brought change. He put those guardrails back up. He says, no, no, we're going to get to there. In order to do that, we're going to have to have the guardrails of his word. It was awesome. But then I kept reading in that story, and the thing that was so heartbreaking to me is that the next king, who should have been paying attention, he once again did what was evil. So it's heartbreaking to realize that so many times in the lineage of the kings of Israel, the, you know, the occasional one would rise up who would do great and honor God and clean up the land and take them on this amazing journey. And they would experience God's favor and God's blessing. And then the next one would come up and go, ah, never mind that. It's as if they failed to bring up a generation to carry on God's plan. It's as if they failed to help get them from here to there. You know, Psalm 145 is a scripture that Philip referenced last week, and we talked a lot about in our legacy nights. And it's, uh, I think they'll put it on the screen, Psalm 145, verse 4. So let's read this together too. Ready? One, two, three. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. See, one generation is supposed to tell of the amazing promises of God. They're supposed to take the word and pass it to a generation, which is what I hope I'm doing up here. See, the book, this book is full of wisdom to help you get from here to there. Maybe, you know, whether it's in your finances, this book has wisdom about how to get from here to there, or maybe in your relationships. You know what? In every relationship, you're going to go through painful times. All I can say is that it's his word that directs me. It is his word that helps me manage my emotions. And for me, in my health, you know, 14 years ago, my here was cancer. So I was diagnosed with cancer. That was my here. My there was health. So for me, right now, talking to you, I have to commend one generation. Understand what I did when I was going from my here, which was sickness, to my there, which would be health. I pulled out his word, and I declared his word over my life. Psalm 103 says, he has forgiven my sins and healed my diseases. Now, I am grateful for the doctors and the help I got, but it was his word that kept me getting back up. Every time there'd be a bad test result, I would get back up and declare the truth of his word. So maybe there's somebody in here today, and that's what you need to hear, is someone from this generation declaring the goodness of God in your life and in your body. I can declare the goodness of God. And right now there are volunteers right in that, right next door to us, behind the black curtain in that building, passing on the hope of this book to your children and to your young people. It's not just Bible stories, but it's the hope and life that's found in the Bible. So if we're going to get from here to there, we're going to need the direction from here, from this Bible. And if we're going to get from here to there, we also need strength. You know, Psalm 1832 says this, said, it is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. Proverbs 31:17 says, she girds herself with strength. And that word strength is broken down to mean spiritual strength, mental strength, and physical fitness for her God-given task. and makes her arm strong and firm. So to get from here to there, again, wherever you're there is, it'll take strength. Spiritual strength, mental strength, physical strength. So spiritual strength. Let me just ask you, how, how's your relationship with God? Is it real? Are you reading your Bible? Do you spend any time praying? How is your trust God thermometer? Second Peter chapter 1 begins by saying that God has given us everything we need to live this life pleasing to him, it, live a life that we can get from here to there. I mean, there's a lot of promises in that portion of Scripture. And then it continues in Second Peter 1, it says this, Beginning with verse 5, it says, So don't lose a minute in building on what you've been given, complementing your basic faith with good character, spiritual understanding, alert discipline, passionate patience, reverent wonder, warm friendliness, and generous love, each dimension fitting into and developing the others. With these qualities active and growing in your lives, no, gra no day will pass, no, no grass will grow under your feet, no day will pass without its reward as you mature in your experience of our Master Jesus. So basically, what he's saying, if we're going to get from here 
to there, this is what spiritual strength looks like. It looks like alert discipline, passionate patience, reverent wonder, warm friendliness, generous love. So I started thinking, here's my here. Are you going to be my obstacle again? Okay, you just hang right there. So there's a story in the Bible about David. And David, as a young boy, was out tending the sheep. And while he was out there, he was anointed to be king. The prophet anointed him to be king. So here he is with the sheep. That's his here. His there was a throne. And wouldn't it have been nice? Here to there, easy, but no. The ram showed up again, <laughs> right? Anointed king, but here his family didn't believe in him. His family didn't believe in him. And then comes up along here, and then King Saul is trying to kill him, right? And somehow he manages to get back that. And Sorry, thanks for being part of the sermon. And he, that's, that's his there, right? So here's a, here's a time when he, David, is hiding in a cave. And King Saul walks in and doesn't know that David's in that cave. And David's thinking, well, I mean, I would have been thinking, God, you sent him to me for me to take him out right now. <laughs> because he is between my here and my there. But in this moment, David didn't kill him. He honored the position, even if he couldn't the man. He honored the position. And his there was right there. He also had a bunch of people behind him, things. A bunch of people behind him going, take him out! Because they knew where David was headed. They knew that was his there, but he didn't. He honored the position. Now, years later, eventually, he became king. Eventually, he became king. But you know what was being developed in him with every obstacle that came up? Spiritual strength. So that by the time he became king, he was not a king like Saul had been. He didn't lord it over. He came to king as a king with a humble heart. Spiritual strength. If we want to get from here to there, it's going to take spiritual strength. And I love that definition in there. Warm friendliness, generous love. Listen, if you love only the people who are like you, that's not generous. It's so easy to love the people that love me. Oof. So easy to love the people that say all the things I want them to say and how I want them to say it. But spiritual strength is loving, period. And if I'm going to get from here to there, yeah. And it's going to take mental strength. Spiritual strength and mental strength. So a few years ago, I decided to go back to school with the goal of getting my master's in theological leadership. Wow, man, I am reading some really fat textbooks. I had to learn how to footnote all again. Formatting, don't they understand I know how to write sermons and like, oh, and writing papers on the doctrine of God. Exactly, and a, <laughs> and a biblical worldview and what the hypostatic union really is and what is the book of John, and how do, you, how do you break that down, and what does Ephesians really mean when it's, I'm writing all of these papers, and you know what, I, I don't know where it's all going to lead, I just want it to begin. See, we all want to get there, we want the promotion, but have you learned anything new? Why should you get the promotion? Has your skill set gotten bigger? I mean, on another level, as far as mental strength, how are you handling those emotions? Do they lead you? Can you control your anger? Or are you just snapping and waving at people with one finger and kicking the dog and stuff? Can you control the anger? 
Is courage being enlarged in you or fear? Jealousy or security in who God says you are? Love or hate? Peace or chaos? Joy or sorrow? And for me, sometimes mental strength involves my mouth. Now, there are moments when I need the strength to open my mouth with wisdom for those who are unable to, just like it says in Proverbs 31. But this one is harder. For me, sometimes I just need the strength to keep it shut. And see, for some of you, perhaps you are a little more introverted than me, so you're going, well, that's not my problem. Well, good for you. (laughs) And so I read the stories recently. I've been reading through all the Gospels and all the accounts of Jesus when he was taken before his accusers. And there were so many times when when things were being said about him that were not true. He was being treated absolutely unjustly, and he didn't defend himself. Ah! I always feel the need that I have to defend myself and I have to go to you. No, that's not what happened. No, split, split, split. Sometimes mental strength is shutteth upeth. <laughs> now, not for you, of course, because you're all perfect, but for me. Not defend myself, not justify myself. Just trust God as my defender. Yeah. And then, if we're going to get from here to there. It'll take, it'll take physical strength. So let me just ask you, are you taking care of the one and only body that you've been entrusted with to fulfill the mission that God has assigned you? You know, I have to just give BHD, Brandon Hunter Davis, some props right here because he just started this, what is it called, 80 Days of Horror, 80 Day <laughs> Obsession. Because he's committed, so he's on our team and leads worship, and, but he's committed to getting healthy. And I, I sort of said something to him as a mother. I said, I need you strong and healthy to finish the race that God has assigned you. I love you too much. I need you to finish this. And so he's already lost nine pounds. I know. And so it's not about, it's not about looking a certain way. It's about being healthy. Listen, there's some very skinny, unhealthy people too. So it's not, about how, it's not about that, it's about being healthy so you can finish the race that God's trusted you with. And you won't if you eat a diet of fried everything and smoke everything that you can't. It's not going to happen. And I'm just saying to you, I need you to finish the race that God's trusted you with. Christianity is not about a faith one person at a time. One, no, it's about all of us together. See, if you don't get to your there, it will affect me. Because we're not a bunch of individuals, we are a body. We're a body. And so I need you to be developing that spiritual strength and that mental strength and that physical strength so that together we can get there. Proverbs 24, 10 says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. You know, one of the definitions for strength is durability. It just means keep, keep going. Be committed to being committed. Don't give up. Don't give up. An obstacle might come up. Maybe it simply is a redirect. Maybe it's an obstacle for you to speak to and keep speaking to and keep speaking to and declaring the truth. Just like I did when I was navigating cancer, speaking to it and speaking to it and speaking to it and speaking to it. But there's been many times just in my job when an obstacle would come up and I go, I speak to it and it doesn't move. So I go, maybe it's a redirect. Maybe God's sending me over here. But we'll never get to the there if we actually don't trust his word, if we don't let his word be the guardrails, if we don't let his word be the lamp to our feet, give us direction for every step, and we won't get there if we actually don't develop strength. The spiritual strength, mental strength, and there is no such, you can't take a pill that'll give it to you. Man, I wish I could just take a pill and have all the spiritual strength I need. No, it's developed when you hit an obstacle and hit an obstacle and hit an obstacle and you keep getting up and you don't start seeking vengeance on your own. You forgive people. I never feel like forgiving people, just so we're clear. I don't forgive them because I feel like it. But if I'm gonna actually get to my there, I can't carry that offense with me. It's just like a ball and chain around my foot. 
You've got to let it go. So I don't know what it is for you. Maybe you're in here and you go, you know what? Okay, so I understand that here's the here and there's the there. And, uh, but there's some obstacles in the way. Maybe there's some of you in here, there's just some obstacles. I don't know what would be for you. Maybe yours is health. Maybe yours is finances. Maybe yours is fear. I don't know. Anybody in here have an obstacle on your path from here to there? Okay, why don't you just stand up right now? I'm just going to pray. See? I knew this was the right message. So I don't know what obstacle might be in front of you. Maybe yours is like just a, a diagnosis that's freaky. I don't know. Maybe that's yours. Or maybe yours is you just can't get the job. It's not that you're not trying. You just can't get the job. Or maybe yours is a relationship that's fractured or and so some of those obstacles you need to know what the word of God says so you can speak to it and some of them you just have to maintain your spiritual strength and some of them you have to be willing to be redirected because maybe you think this is your career path but God goes no 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 it's actually over here I don't know but what I'm going to pray is I'm going to speak to those obstacles, and then I'm going to pray and ask God for wisdom, right? Because maybe that's what we need to find the path that he actually has for us, okay? Father, I thank you for your word. And right now, I come against the obstacles that would be in the path of your kids. That obstacle of a disease and sickness right now, I curse that sickness in Jesus' name. Jesus, I thank you that you went to the cross to pay the price so that my brother and my sister could be healed and healthy and whole. And so I just destroy that obstacle in Jesus' name. We forget not your benefits. You forgive our sins and heal our diseases. That's the truth. And then, God, I just pray for wisdom. Maybe some of my brothers and sisters are just encountering an obstacle and maybe they've declared the word over of God over but it's still there and so God I just ask for wisdom that perhaps this is a mystery or redirect maybe there's another another way that you want us to get to there perhaps another path another way and so I pray God that all of us in this room we would not be so stubborn that we couldn't recognize you're leading us to there, but it just doesn't look like we thought. Help us, Lord God. Give us the wisdom. Your word promises that if we ask for wisdom, the book of James, you give it to us. And the wisdom that you give is there is no changing shadows. It's the good gift. It's, it's just what we need. 